Good morning, everybody, and uh, welcome back uh, for the Sunday message. And uh, the messages are going to continue to go out online, so uh, please bear with us. Uh, we will be back in the church soon, God willing. You know, Hebrews 10 does tell us that uh, we are not to forsake the assembling of the uh, congregation and that we are to exhort each other and encourage each other. And so that's what we're doing. The messages are going to continue to go out online. Uh, praise God, uh, the Word of God, uh, to go out into the church and into the world. You know, it, there's power in that and, uh, you know, it strengthens the church. And so just please bear with us and... Uh, the, the messages are going to continue to go out weekly on Wednesdays and Sundays and, and, and daily uh, in the morning. There's going to be the thought for the day from, from Pastor. Uh, so we're just going to give this in prayer and uh, yeah, let God uh, bring the word, let God bring the message. So Heavenly Father, I thank you that we can gather together in the Spirit, Lord. I ask Heavenly Father that your words come out of my mouth. Lord, that as I open my mouth, you fill it. Uh, Lord, Father, I ask that uh, it touches the hearts of your church, Lord, whilst we're in this lockdown, Lord. Lord, I pray you strengthen your church. It's your church, Father. Lord, I pray you bless the words that go through this microphone into the, into the homes, Lord, that, and into the hearts and ears and eyes, Lord, that are meant to see and hear it, Lord. Open hearts, Lord give this message to you be the glory in Jesus name. Amen. So uh, morning everybody. Uh, I want to speak to you about Jesus this morning and you know Jesus is the greatest thing uh, that's ever happened to me in my life and if you're a Christian I'm sure we can all say the same thing and I'm going to be speaking in particular on the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. You know it's something that's been written about over the years, you know, the Old Testament and the New Testament speak quite a lot about the second coming of the Lord. And actually, in the Old Testament uh, in particular, it was called the Day of the Lord. And, and it really, the Day of the Lord was quite broad. It meant that God was coming down and intervening in the affairs of his people. And, and we are approaching the Day of the Lord. And that's the second coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. And I'm going to be reading from Matthew 25 shortly because you can turn there. Because there's no one better to describe or no one better to read about than Jesus about his second coming. You know, the disciples asked him a really important question. And I think they got more than they bargained for, to be perfectly honest. You know, they were in, in Matthew 24, just to give a quick summary. The disciples came to Jesus privately and they actually asked him a question privately. And they said to him, you know, what are the signs that you're going to be coming back. You know, what are the signs of the, t of the end times or signs of the ends of the age? And as I said, I think the disciples got more than they bargained for because Jesus then gives them this two-chapter response to their question. You know, Jesus turns around to them and says, there'll be great deception. There'll be deception like no one has ever seen. And I'm paraphrasing here, but he says, people will come saying, I am the Christ or I am Jesus and they will deceive many. You know, I, I looked at a, a study on people that have called themselves Jesus Christ over the centuries and just last century there was 22 well-known people that, or people that were well-known for calling themselves or saying they were Jesus Christ and they led many people away. You know, these people were deceiving people by saying, I'm Jesus Christ. And deception is in our community at the moment. You know, we see deception across social media it's very prevalent. You know, any truth that's in society seems to get swallowed up by a load of lies or misinformation. And any truth about the Lord Jesus Christ seems to be discredited in the world at the moment. There's a great deception going on. You know, people are being deceived. And that's the start. That's what Jesus said to his disciples. There will be great deception. He said there'll be wars and there'll be rumours of wars. In the last century, we had two world wars. 100 million people were killed in two world wars. It was unprecedented. Rumours of wars, you know, we had a period of time last century where there was threats of complete nuclear annihilation, where the, the threats of dropping nuclear bombs on countries, because we have the ability now, man has the ability now to completely wipe out a complete race or people or country. 
And there was fear. Fear gripped the world for decades that countries were going to destroy, a country would destroy another country or the world would just destroy each other. Rumours of wars. It's called the Cold War because no war actually happened. It was just rumours of wars. You know, Jesus says, hang on a sec, the end is not yet. You'll hear of wars and rumours of wars, he said, but the end is not yet. As if to say, more is to come. He said, nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom and there'll be famine, there'll be pestilence and there'll be earthquakes in various places. And we see famine. I'm looking, I looked on this famine counter yesterday and, and it, it was quite tragic. There was a famine count of people that have died from directly as a result of famine this year. And the count was over seven and a half million and rising. I came back to the computer five minutes later and had gone up a hundred people. It's tragic. Pestilence, I don't need to remind people the pestilence that we're in. Pestilence means disease. And we're currently locked down because of a disease. You know, and COVID aside, if you look at cancer, one in two people are predicted to get cancer in, at the moment. It's an epidemic. COVID aside, th that's an epidemic. And Jesus says there'll be earthquakes, and not just earthquakes, because we, we've had earthquakes all throughout history, but he said earthquakes in various places. And we hear of earthquakes on a daily basis, from quite small, constant earthquakes to, to mass earthquakes. There was one the other day, and loss of life through earthquakes. All of these things must come before Christ returns. And he says this to his disciples. And he said, and Jesus spoke on tribulation. He spoke on the beast or the Antichrist. And he spoke about prophets that would come and deceive many. And people would say, look, there's Christ. Or look, he's got the truth. And he's saying, do not be deceived. I'm not coming back like that. I'm going to be reading shortly from Matthew chapter 25, starting in verse 17, uh, 14. Because Jesus gives us this parable. You know, he's telling the disciples all of these things, and it would have sounded quite grim, but I actually think the disciples would have thought that they were in the end times as well as we are today. I, I do believe we're in the end times, or at least, as Pastor Patrick was saying, we're heading for end times, because Jesus has given us a road map. He's given us a street signs to his return, and that's the expectation that we have as Christians. And he gives us all of these things and then he gives us to us in this picture. He says, but you see a fig tree. You see a fig tree and its branches start to sprout and it, become, and it gets leaves. And you know summer's coming. So he's saying, now you can see that I'm coming. When you see these things happening, discern the signs of the times. And as Christians, it's very important for us to discern these signs. Just discern the signs or ask the question that the disciples asked Jesus. You know, what are the signs of the ends of the age? Or what's the signs of you returning? Jesus was very clear about it. There's a reason for that. We need to be aware. And in the parable of the talents, he gives this beautiful picture. He gives, I love that Jesus gives parables because he gives it to us in plain language and then he gives it to us to reinforce it with a picture. You know, and it's, and it's for us. You know, Jesus gives us a heavenly meaning story in an, in an earthly manner. It's a spiritual meaning in, in the physical. And it's things that we can understand. And the parable of the talents is no different. He's talking about his return. Jesus actually, in this parable, tells us that he, one, is returning. How he's going to be returning as well. And what's going to happen when he returns? You know, there's four points I want to raise in this uh, parable, and I'm going to read it shortly. I want to raise four points of Jesus explaining the kingdom of heaven. He then explains our faith walk. He then explains the second coming of Christ. And lastly, judgment. Everything we need to know in our walk is contained in this parable. And it goes like this. It says, For the kingdom of heaven is like a man travelling to a faraway country, 
who called his servants and delivered his goods to them. And to one he gave five talents, to another two, to another one, to each according to his own ability. And immediately he went on a journey. This is Jesus' description of, a, of the kingdom of heaven. And when Jesus is giving this parable, this is the week leading up to his crucifixion. This is different from the parable of the miners that you would find in Luke chapter 19. It's a different parable. This stands alone, this parable, the parable of the talents. And he's, lead, he's going to the cross. And he gives this parable to his disciples. And he says, this is what the kingdom of heaven is like. He said, I am going to the cross and I'm going away. But I'm going to send you someone. I'm going to send you a helper. I'm going to send you counsel. I'm going to send you comfort. I'm going to send you power. That's the Holy Spirit. So Jesus died and rose again so he can send the Holy Spirit to the disciples, to us. That was the gift that he sent us. We'd be lost without it. Jesus says that he goes away, but he's entrusting us with something. What he entrusted us with belongs to him. It's of God. It's, he describes it as a talent. And he describes it as a talent in the Greek word that's written in there. It's called talantin. It means a, a unit of measure of weight of uh, gold or silver. So it's not actually a coin, it's a unit or a measure of wealth. But he gives them something uh, quite wealthy. One talent equals 600 denarii. Uh, that doesn't mean anything to me, apart from the fact that it's 20 years wages for an average person. That's what they believe his, this cost or the wealth that he was bestowing to them. So he gives the first one five talents. The second servant, he gives two. The third, he gives one. So Jesus is the master here and he's going away to the cross. He's dying, rising again. He's going away to be with the Father, but he sent the Holy Spirit and he gives us wealth. And it's for our walk, for our benefit. See, talent there is, we, get, we actually get the English word talent from this story or to be talented. So we've anglicised the word from something monetary to something that we own that's, that's we're, we're talented. And you could apply that to us as Christians. The three here are servants. They all call him Lord. They're servants of Christ. That's who he's referring to. This is our walk as Christians. So the first one he gives five talents to and he says, go, go and invest it. You know, Second one, do the same. Third one, do the same. And he does that because he gives according to abilities. In Romans 12, it says that we, are, we, are, we all have different abilities or we all have different functions. And we're all given according to those abilities by the grace of God. And in the second part there, this t and it goes into our faith walk. The second part there, he says, Then he who had received the five talents went and traded with them. And he made another five talents. And likewise, he who had received two gained two more also. But he who had received one went and dug it into the ground and hid his Lord's money. See, the first two servants went out and did what was required and asked of them. And they treated what was given to them, the wealth that was given to them, with respect, with honour. They, they, they treated it the way they saw fit, but it was to honour Christ. It was to honour their master. The third one did something different. We'll get to that in a minute. But in 1 Corinthians 3, 5 to 9, Paul writes this. Who then is Paul? And who is Apollos, but ministers through whom you believed, as the Lord gave to each one? I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. So then neither he who plants is anything, nor he who waters, but God who gives the increase. Now he who plants and he who waters are one, and each one will receive his own reward according to his own labour. For we are God's fellow workers, you are God's field, you are God's building. The third one did something very different. See, the first two servants understood that 
they understood that they were being given something, a talent, wealth. However you want to look at the provision God gives us, it could even be money, provision money that God gives us. I have seen messages given on this parable to justify the church, asking the church for tithes. And I, I, I don't believe that's what Christ is saying here. I don't believe he's saying, he's referencing money for that reason. You know, when Christ was asked about paying taxes, he said, render to Caesar what is Caesar's and render to God what is God's. I have no need for money. Money is just part of the walk. God will provide. It's about our provision, God's provision in, in everything in our lives. And that includes gifts and fruits that the Holy Spirit give us. You know, that's, that is talents. You know, we all have different talents. You know, God provides that according to our abilities. But I believe that this parable, or I believe what Christ wants us to know, the church today, about this parable, it's the simple things Christ was looking at, the condition of their hearts. See, the first two servants looked at the wealth that they had been given, and they knew God would bring the increase, so they planted it in the kingdom. One may have planted, one may have watered. God brought the increase. The third one didn't. He planted it in the world. He planted that in the earth and it brought zero increase. The reason being is the world is different from the kingdom. It says that you have friendship with the world, you have enmity with God. They are opposing. So you can't take something that belongs to God, his wealth, and invest it in the kingdom or invest it in the world and expect two different, uh, the same result. You invest it into the world, you will get zero back. And actually, when judgment comes, which we'll see shortly, what even you have will be taken away from you. It will be removed from you. Like a crown can be removed from us. So it goes on, and this is the second coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. It said, after a long time, the Lord... <clears throat> After a long time, the Lord of those servants came and settled, settled accounts with them. He who had received five talents came and bought five talents, five other talents, saying, Excuse me. Lord, you delivered to me five talents. Look, I have gained five talents besides them. And this is what we all want to hear. His Lord said to him, Well done. Good and faithful servant. You were faithful with a few things. I will make you ruler over many things. Enter into the joy of your, of the, of your Lord. Come into heaven. Plain and simple. Enter into the joy of the Lord. Enter into the eternal kingdom that I promised you. Because you have been faithful with, the, with a few things, I will give you many things. The story, the parable of the miners was a different parable, but he said something similar. You know, I'll give you 10 cities. I'll give you, I'll give you, I'll give you the eternity. This is what his Lord was saying. The next one did the same thing. He also, who had received two talents, <clears throat> came and said, Lord, you delivered to me two talents. Look, I have gained two more talents besides them. His Lord said to him, and get this, same reward. Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a few things. I will make you ruler over many things. Enter into the joy of the, of the Lord. This is his second coming. Jesus returns and they were found faithful. What Christ had given to them, they had been trustworthy with. They had multiplied it. See, when Christ comes... We have been given, a, this is why we've been given a roadmap by Jesus. Because he says, I want you to see, you know, when, when the fig tree starts to bloom, summer's coming, I want you to see that when these things start to happen, and we are closer now today to Christ's coming than we were yesterday. And Christ may come tonight. I believe that in my heart because I read this and I'm a Christian and I believe in Christ and what he says. He's coming back, but he says, you don't know the day nor the hour, and you're not meant to know it. 
the amount of people that have predicted Christ's return, I, I don't know how they can be in such error. It's so clear. I will come like a thief in the night. I will come like a thief in the night. Be ready. The parable before the talents, he spoke about the, the virgins and how they would trim their lamps and, and have oil and so they could go out and be ready. And the, the reason for that parable was Christ was saying, you need to be ready. And that's all he said in that parable, you need to be ready. So it leaves the open question of, well, well how? How are, we, how are we to be ready? So he gives the parable of the talents. This is how you're ready for when I return. You won't know when I come. See, when Jesus returns, he won't be coming back to save. When Christ came and died and rose again, he came for redemption. He came to rescue. When Christ returns again, he'll be coming back for judgment. He will be coming back to rule and reign and it will be too late by then. It will be too late because he says, my return is like this. As lightning flashes from the east to the west, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. I come like a thief in the night, he says. Be ready. Be ready. What have you done with my wealth? And this is judgment here as well. Don't think the first two servants didn't escape judgment because we're all judged. But you're either judged righteous or unrighteous. And so often in the world at the moment, we see people aligning themselves to political movements or agendas and we're seeing... We're seeing chaos, almost chaos in America with the election at the moment. People align themselves to the left or to the right or to an ideal or a, a movement or a, a, a thought process or a political agenda or a man. When Christ returns, he says, I will separate the sheep from the goats. Like a herd of sheep separates sheep and goats. The goats will go to the left and the sheep will go to the right. Righteous and unrighteous. One will go to heaven, one will go to hell. Very real. There is an everlasting fire that this world is going to and as Christians, we need to have fire in our bones and a, almost, and Christ says, you know, my burden is, is light, my yoke is easy, but we've got to be burdened for that. That's a good burden with that. As Christians, we've got to see that people in the world are going to hell. Plain and simple. And Jesus, when he comes back, it'll be too late for those people, I will separate the sheep from the goats. And God has given us a gift. Christ left us wealth that we might multiply it. And that's people. That is people. That is the simplicity of our walk that I believe Jesus is coming back for. And will hold us accountable for it. This is how he held the third servant accountable. He said, then who had received one talent came and said, and this is what I picked out of this parable is that Jesus didn't ask them to give an account of what they'd done. They just knew they had to do it. They just started speaking. The first two servants went, Lord, here, this is what I've done with what you've given me. And they were, there was joy in that. The third servant, he knew what was accounted for him as well. Jesus didn't have, or the, the master didn't have to ask him. They just knew to respond. And he said, Lord, I knew you to be a hard man, reaping where you have not sown and gathering where you have not scattered seed. So he knew his character. We know Christ's character. We know there is an expectation from him. I was afraid and I went out and I hid your talent in the ground. And in Mark 8, he says, if you're ashamed of me and my words, I'll be ashamed of you in front of the Father and his holy angels. What he was given, he hid and he planted in the earth. He hid it. But his Lord answered and said to him, You wicked and lazy servant. You knew I reap where I have not sown and gather where I have not scattered seed. So you ought to have deposited my money with the bankers and at my coming I would have received back my own with interest. Therefore, take the talent from him and give it to him who has ten. For everyone who has, more will be given and he who will have abundance. But from him who does not have, even what he has 
will be taken away. This is the eternal judgment that he receives. And I, I reckon, I believe in my heart, I reckon this would break Jesus' heart. I, I, you know, we say so often, you know, break my heart for what breaks yours, Christ. And to be honest, I wrote this in tears this week because people are going to an eternal damnation. He says, cast the unprof unprofitable servant into the outer darkness. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. See, that third servant knew that there was something required of him. And Christ came back and he judged him righteously. So when Christ comes back, he judges. And his judgment is righteous. See, that word judgment there comes from the, word, the Greek word crisis or crisis. We get the word crisis out of it. The English word crisis comes from judgment. It means to separate. It means to judge unrighteous to righteous. This is what happens at Christ's returning. And we can look at all of the things in the world that are happening. We can look at all the things and, and the road signs that are pointing to his return, are pointing to the time when he will come riding on the clouds like lightning. This is reality. Christ will return. You know, you speak to people in the world and they go, I never saw this pandemic coming. I never saw it coming. And I was the same. And I believed the word. But this is what's happening. Who do we think we are that we know the beginning from the end? Christ is the beginning from the end. In Genesis, the four first words of Genesis is, in the beginning, God. He is the beginning. Man isn't. At the end, in Revelation 22, Jesus says three times, he says three times, surely or behold, I am coming quickly. I am coming quickly. It's going to be sudden. Every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that he is the Lord. But just because you're confessing that he is Lord doesn't mean you go to heaven. It's your walk that matters. It's how you're found. It's whether you have been dealt uh, righteous with the things that God has given you. See, I believe that Christ is coming back for the simplicity of our walk, the things in our heart. You know, gifts matter, fruits matter, provisions matter, and we, they've all got to be multiplied. But I don't believe that's his heart here. I don't believe that's what he's talking about. I believe he's talking about the, the greatest commandment. You know, when the, the Pharisees would always question Christ, and they said, what is the greatest law? What is the greatest law, teacher? What is the greatest commandment? Love God with all your heart, your mind, your soul. Love him with everything. If you do that, everything else will fall into place. It's the same with your fruits and your giftings. If you love God with all you have, with every fibre of your being, you will get everything else right and you will be able to love your neighbour as yourself, which is the two greatest commandments Christ gave. See, the Jews never walked into that. The Jews that don't, didn't take up Christ didn't believe he was the Messiah. And I'm talking about the Pharisees and the scribes and the Sadducees, the people of the law. back then. And they were righteous according to the law. But Jesus says, that doesn't justify you. That doesn't save you, I do. And that's the same with our, walk, our works. Christ is coming back to look at what works we've done. Absolutely. But in James 2, he says, I have faith, you have works. Show me your faith uh, without works and I'll show you my faith by my works. You know, I was standing outside this week and I was seeking the Lord on the message and it's, it's my favourite spot in the garden. We're on the side of my house, it's li our house is lined with trees and for some strange reason, I like watching the wind blow through the tops of the trees. Um, I, just, I just like it. And I asked the Lord, I said, Lord, you know, what, what do you want your church to hear? You know, and I was sort of pondering on this message. And in my heart, he said, where does the wind come from? I said, I don't know, but I can see it in the trees. 
He says, that's your faith. That's how you see your faith. See, faith we can't see because it's, it's evidenced in the things we don't see, right? Hebrews talks about that. Our faith is in Christ and, and, and we look through a glass dimly. But show me your faith without your works, but I'll show you my faith by my works. And so that's what Christ is doing when he comes back. Your faith will look like something to us on earth here and it will look like something because Jesus goes on. I'm going to read it in a minute. Jesus says, this is what it looks like. Simple, Christ-like faith walk. This is what Christ, this is how it looks. It says, when the Son of Man comes into his glory and all his holy angels with him, then he will sit on the throne of his glory and all nations will be gathered before him. Then he, uh, it says that he will separate them, one from another, sheep as a sheep, um, a shepherd divides the sheep from the goats and he will set the sheep on the right and the goats on the left. Then the king will say to those on the right, come, blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you before the foundation of the world. Beginning and end. Christ is the Alpha and the Omega. For I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty and you gave me drink. I was a stranger and you took me in. I was naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison. You came to me. Then the righteous will answer him saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you thirsty and give you a drink? When did we see you a stranger and take you in or naked and clothe you? Or when did we see you sick or in prison and come to you? And the king will answer and say to them, Assuredly, I say to you, and as much as you did it for one of the least of my brethren, you did it to me. Simple faith, walk, that's love. And that's doing it in Christ's name. And I'm not talking about going out and joining an NGO that, and being some sort of humanitarian. I'm talking about going out in Christ's name, declaring the word of God, because Christ says, I won't return until my word has been preached to all nations. Look at the age that we're in. Everyone's connected. The reason we hear about all these earthquakes is because we're all connected. Never used to be the case. We are living in unprecedented times. This is the simple faith walk. He's coming back for us as Christians. And I want to ask the church today, are you ready? When Christ returns, are you going to be found wanting? I know this has made me search my heart because to love God with everything you have is tough in the world. But that's our walk and we must grow day by day by day. Spurgeon says, if you're not growing, you're backsliding. It's pretty harsh, but we've got to grow each day in him, even if it's a little. We go through seasons, right? Little and, and lots, you know, we can be quickened in the spirit, but this is what Jesus is coming back for. The simple faith. Everything else will follow. The gifts, the ministries, the talents, it'll be given to us according to our abilities. See, when Christ gave the talents to those servants, the two first servants didn't look at each other and go, he got five, he got two. They accepted what God gave to him because they knew they were different. And they knew that they were given according to their ability so they could walk the life God had prepared for them. And when God came back, he took the five talents, the, the doubled five talents and the doubled two talents, and he gave them the same reward. He didn't reward one over the other because he had done, he had done better. With, it was the same result. That is our walk, but it's got to be with Christ. And I can tell you, church, when we go to be with the Lord on that day, whether we go to be with him before he comes back or when he returns, you won't have anyone standing next to you. And like the third servant, you know, it says in Matthew 7, not all people that say, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only those who do the will of my Father. The will of Jesus Christ and is the will of God. And his will is to love him with everything and love one another with everything. That is the walk. If you get that, 
everything else will fall into place. That's trusting in God to do the things that he promised. And those Pharisees that said to Christ, what's the greatest commandment? And he gave them those commandments. They didn't understand. They didn't want to understand it because they held on to the law and that was their comfort and that was how they were righteous. And and, and that's not where we are to be as Christians. The Jews, or in Judaism, there's 613 commandments or laws. It's impossible. It's impossible to maintain that. There are so many laws and rules. It's not about rules. It's about loving God so that we can then walk in his order and walk according to his commandments and walk according to obedience. That will happen. But Christ is coming quickly. Because he says, behold. Uh, If we turn to Revelation chapter 22, the end of the word, but but not the end. There is an eternity with Christ. In verse 7 there, Jesus says, behold, I am coming quickly. And in verse 12, he says, behold, I am coming quickly. As if once wasn't enough, he repeated it. You know, and this is John receiving these revelations from Christ. Christ is saying, behold, I'm coming quickly. Almost like he's shaking John. Tell my children. Tell them I'm coming and it's going to be quick. But I love that. Behold, I am. Behold, I am. You know, I am the door. I am the bread of life. I am the way, the truth and the life. I am the light of the world. I'm the true vine. I'm the good shepherd. You know, he is the great I am. There is no one else. And when he was asked his name, he said, it's I am, because I am everything, beginning, end. And Jesus says, I am the Alpha and the Omega. He says, I'm coming quickly. My reward is with me to give to everyone according to his work. I'm coming with reward, but I'm going to see what you've done with my talent. I'm going to see what you have done with the wealth I've given you. And as Pastor Patrick preached the other week, have you walked worthy of your calling? Have you walked worthy? First two servants did, third one didn't. But he knew, he made a decision in his heart, I'm not going to love the Lord with all my heart, I'm not going to love the Lord with all my mind and my soul, I'm going to love the world and I'm going to plant it in the world because I'm afraid that my master would have a, seek an account from He knew that Jesus was coming back to, have, to settle accounts with him. And he was afraid of him. Not a good fear, a worldly fear. Jesus says, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and end of the Greek alphabet, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. And down the bottom there in verse 20, it says, surely, again, now he says, surely, this is the very end of the word, surely, I'm coming quickly. And, and church, this is the question I want to ask today. This is John's response and the word finishes here. This is John's response. And, and we don't know how long Revelation took to, de- to be delivered to John, whether it was done over... A, we don't know. But that would have been <laughs> some revelation for John. Yeah, I, I, you know, the poor man, almost, he would have been given vision after vision and revelation after revelation, and it would have been foreign to the man. And he, I, can, I get this picture of him scribbling down as fast as he can what he's seeing, and the angel almost saying, you know, slow down, get it right. But John, at the end of the word here, says this, Amen. In other words, let it be done. He says, even so, come. Even so, come. Even so, come, Lord Jesus. This is what he says. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. And I want to ask that question today, church. Can we say that in your heart? And this is not to do with the person sitting next to you. This is between you and God. Even so, come. Can you say that in your heart? Right now, even so, come. Because that's a challenge. But this should draw us closer to him because 
The time is coming. The time is here. Jesus may return tonight. Do you, will you be found wanting? Because by then, it's too late. Too late. Judgment's been passed. You won't have time to suddenly repent and say, Lord, Lord. Because he says, not all people that say, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. Only those who do the will of my Father. Only those who love God with all of, of your heart. Only those who love each other. Only those who go to the prison. Only those who go into the home of the widow. Only those who feed the people in famine or care for the sick in pestilence or care for the broken people in earthquakes. You know, this is our walk as Christians. And how, how are we faring? How are we faring? And it's not about saying in your heart, I've got to do more because it's going to give me justification to get into the kingdom. Christ justified us. But if you walk in that justification, you will do works worthy. But when he returns, he finds your walk worthy. So that's the question the church, I believe, needs to ask itself today. Can we say, even so come, Lord Jesus? Even so come. And I'm almost caught in two minds. I, I, I want... I, uh, not that I'm double-minded, but I, I want Christ to return and I want him to return now because I, I want to experience that and I want to see my, my Lord and Saviour come in glory. But there's a part of my heart that goes, not just yet, Lord, I, I want to do more. I, I want to I, I love people. I, I want to see people redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. And I, I do. People are going to hell. You know, I watched the counter of 100 people go up in five minutes on the famine counter and I wondered where they were going. You know, Christ or God didn't create hell for us. He created it for Satan and his angels. But because he's a just God and because man sinned and turned against the living God, that becomes a home for people who reject him. And I believe that's one of the things that breaks Christ's heart. That's why he came and sacrificed himself on the cross. And he came in humility. He's coming back in glory. Came to save. But he's coming back to judge. He came as a lamb to the slaughter. But it says in my word, he's coming back as a lion. The lion of the tribe of Judah. And every knee will bow. And this is... Not just the people on the earth, this is entire human history. Every knee will bow, every tongue will confess that he is the Christ. But it's too late for the people that haven't, because not everyone who says, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. Can we just turn to uh, Thessalonians? You know, it's, it's really incumbent upon us to, to deliver the word of God. And when Christ said, the word needs to be preached to the entire world before I return, he meant it. And this is why he gave us his word. It's power. Penetrates to joints and marrow and soul and spirit. And he gave us the commission to deliver this. And as pastor preached the other week, you, we're not all called to be preachers, but we're all of us called to preach. Every single one of us. Because it says in Mark 16, 15, go into all the world and preach the good news to all creation, to all creatures. I watched a, a, a show on the weekend, a documentary on uh, Nick Ripkin. His name. It's not his real name, but that's his name that he goes under because he's a a missionary um, that uh, doesn't want his identity be, to be shown. And, and uh, it's called The Insanity of God. And, and it's this mission that had lost. He suffered loss in the mission field. He lost a son and you know, he suffered loss. And he saw persecution firsthand in Somalia and, and Malawi and South Africa. You know, amazing story because God's involved. 
But he set off to find persecuted Christians around the world, China, Russia, uh, you name it, persecuted countries where there's Christians that are being persecuted. And in, in that show, he gives us a, a statistic of the Southern Baptist Church in America. And this statistic was a big section of people, of, of people in the church, had been asked about their faith. And these are people that had grown up in the church. They had attended church every, every week. You know, they'd been faithful with those things. And they, they had a good family life and a good upbringing and, and involved in the church and, and had ministries. And The study showed that 90% of all of those people that were questioned had never spoken to anyone about Christ. 10%. I think it's a sad indictment on the church, today's church, that we don't feel free or we're embarrassed or we don't know the word enough. I don't know how many times I've heard that. I don't know the word enough. I can't speak or share about him. That's a lie. It's a lie from the pit of hell because you carry it in here. And yes, as we heard last the other week, it's important and we must, it's incumbent upon us to put this in our heart. It's incumbent upon us so that we can increase or God can bring the increase because this is the wealth God's given us. He goes, go and do something with it. Preach the word. Jesus didn't say, I came to do all of these things. At the beginning of his walk, he said, I came to preach and teach. And that is to deliver the word. And that is incumbent upon us. And I believe that's one of the things Christ is going to, ask for when he comes back or make an account for and in Mark 8 he says you know if you're ashamed of me in front of people I'll be ashamed of you in front of God and I believe that would break his heart but that's our commission and that's if we're loving God with all we have we would have a hunger and a thirst for that righteousness that we would see people come in into the kingdom in uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, it's entitled, in my word, the day of the Lord. And I'm going to close on this scripture. But Paul writes, he writes to the church in uh, Thessalonica. He says, but concerning the times and seasons, brethren, you have no need that I should write to you. He hadn't been with this church for too long. For you yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so comes as a thief in the night. So he's saying to them, I I really don't need to write to you. You are fully aware that Christ can come back any day. You have been fully told. You fully understand there is no excuse. Ignorance is no defense. For you yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so comes as a thief in the night. For when they say peace and safety then sudden destruction comes upon them as labor pains upon a pregnant woman and they shall not escape you know jesus says it so it was in the days of noah they were eating and drinking and marrying and giving in marriage and they were going about their daily business until the day that noah shut the door or god shut him into that ark same with christ returning People will be going about their daily business oblivious because they've made a decision in their heart or no one's told them about the word or no one's gone and loved on them. He says, but you brethren, this is us, brethren, you are not in darkness. You are not in darkness so that this day should overtake you as a thief. So when we ask the Lord, you know, come Lord Jesus, you know, come Lord Jesus, are we confident that Jesus isn't going to overtake us as a thief? Because that third servant in the the parable of the talents was a servant of Christ, designated a Christian, and his crown was taken away from him. He lost his salvation. Now whether he lost his salvation 
or whether he wasn't redeemed to begin with, that's up to God. But what he had was taken away from him and he went to everlasting fire. But for Christians, for us, we are saved and we're redeemed. We know the Lord. And this day should not overtake us as a thief. You are all sons of light and sons of the day. We are not of the, of the night nor darkness. Therefore, let us not sleep as others do, but let us watch and be sober. So to watch and be sober there is to have the right mind and, and to, to keep our eyes fixed firmly on Christ. And we say it all the time, but it's, it's something we need to continue to walk in is to keep our eyes fixed firmly on the living God through Christ Jesus. Because he says, I am the way, the truth and the life. No man come to the Father except through me. I am. I am the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. There is no one besides me. I am coming. I am coming to, to hold or settle accounts with my church. I am coming back for my bride. And I'm coming back for a bride without spot and blemish. And how are we faring, church? How are we faring in our hearts? You know, I am burdened with this myself. I'm preaching this to myself all week. I'm burdened with it because I want to do what the Lord requires of me. And that's it. Love God with everything. Love each other with, with everything you love God with. You can't get the horizontal one right until you get the vertical one right. That one comes first. And then it's a natural outpouring of love. And it's a natural outpouring of the word. And I believe in the West, we've become fat on this. Absolutely fat. We're privileged. We hear the word all the time. We see the gifts. We see the ministries. We're in a beautiful building. We are blessed upon blessed. We've been given measure upon measure of goodness and righteousness from Christ. There are people in the world that have got very little and they're sold out. And that man I saw in the, uh, on, on the documentary on the weekend, he, he almost envied their walk, these people that were persecuted and locked up in prison. And as I was watching it, I, it, was, it reminded me of the Ethiopian and he had a, a, a piece of scripture, it was Isaiah, a piece of, of, of scripture from Isaiah. And he, and he said to Philip, you know, what does this mean? He explained it to him and I could almost see him jumping out of the chariot and going, Baptize me now. Let's do it. Let's get this show on the road. Sold out. He didn't need to, to sit in the pews for 20 years in order to be sold out. It was this, the condition of his heart. And we're seeing people around the world persecuted. And I said it during the week, that uh, last week, Christians are the most persecuted people group on the planet. There's people in, in, in countries that, that are suffering. And they have a shred, a shred of the word. And it's like, uh, like gold dust to them. It's absolutely like gold. I watched this, this man in prison. That would, he, he was in prison for 17 years for, for reading his Bible to his sons. Got put to prison for 17 years. And, and he, he prayed for a piece of paper and a pen. He got it. A little piece of paper. And he, and he wrote scripture on the, on the page that he could remember and stuck it on the wall. And he got beaten badly for it, nearly killed, but that's all he had. That's all he had in his life. But he had so much in here. This was the abundance that he carried. This was the life that Jesus, Jesus didn't walk with money and possessions. He walked with this. He walked with power and abundance humbly as a man but he had power and, and abundance and out of that abundance his mouth spoke from the heart of God so that's the encouragement I want to I want to give today is that Christ is returning Christ is coming back and he's coming back for his church but he will separate the sheep from the goats and the judgment of the goats, if you want to put it that way, or people that are unrighteous or have rejected Christ or haven't heard of Christ, is something that should burden us in a good way. That daily, 
we should pick up our cross, we should deny ourselves and follow him by loving, com- or loving, speaking the word, love, speak the word, tell someone Jesus loves them. Even if you think you're going to get it wrong, do it because Jesus will be standing there knowing that you're walking the same path that he walked. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I just uh, thank you for your word that you've put in my heart, Lord. I thank you, Lord, that you are coming back. That is the hope we have in you. Lord, I thank you that we are saved by the redeeming blood of the Lamb at the cross and that you rose again, Lord, so that we may have life. Lord, I just pray for the church. Lord, I pray that the church walks in that redemption and walks in that salvation, Lord, and, and what you do is eternal, Lord. And Lord, I just pray that you just build that line upon line and precept upon precept, that Lord, we walk in faith in you and that there'll be a natural outpouring of the Holy Spirit, that wealth, the talent that you sent. Come, Lord Jesus. Come, Lord Jesus. Come into our hearts, Lord Jesus, and do a mighty work. And come, Lord Jesus, that we may be lights in a dark world. Come, Lord Jesus, that we can... We can walk in a world in joy and peace and and your righteousness. Come, Lord Jesus, that we can take our eyes off the things and the, the tragedies and the violence and the disasters that are going around us and the sinful nature of man, that we can set our mind on things above, as we heard from Scott during the week, that we don't set our minds on the things of the earth, We set our minds on you. I pray all this in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.